On the weekend of the 18th to the 19th of July, the world mourned the death of civil rights leader and US politician John Lewis, both offline and online, including on the micro-blogging platform Twitter. Meanwhile, the corner of Twitter occupied by users who live in the southwest of England, and more particularly near the historic city of Bath, logged onto social media to air quite different grievances. On the Saturday evening, residents were struggling to sleep due to loud music booming across the city. Before, during and after the source was discovered, a disused airfield where an illegal rave saw, according to reports, more than 3,000 partygoers attend and which was in full swing, the anger of locals was amply communicated in the 280 characters Twitter allowed them. News outlets and journalists, meanwhile, jumped to the fore to document the event and give updates. At 8.38am, a technology journalist and Bath resident tweeted a summary of the night's goings-on accompanied by a picture showing a mass of people gathering in an open field. At this point, I want to focus your attention on the photo. Hold that thought. There were mixed polarised responses to the journalist's tweet. Perhaps surprising, given that on first glance, the tweet itself doesn't seem that controversial. Some of the responses took the opportunity to reflect on the huge challenges being faced by police. Other comments vented angry criticism of the state of UK policing. One section attacked the journalist's decision to complain about losing a night's sleep, refusing to believe he did not have double glazed windows. Yet others again, and this is what I want to focus on here, pointed out that the picture accompanying the tweet and the news update wasn't from Bath at all. This section of the responses saw a cascade of attacks directed at the journalist. The floodgates of abuse opened and the self-appointed Twitter police rushed out. A couple of hours later, the journalist tweeted a clarification that the picture was from another rave in Manchester two weeks previous, but that his comment on the rave itself stood true. Putting his hands up and correcting the record, he wrote, I tweeted this earlier. The picture was taken in Manchester two weeks ago. The rave, however, is still going on in Bath, before continuing to thank the fellow Twitter user who had pointed out his error. In an exchange later that day with someone sympathetic to the honest mistake he had made, the journalist made a striking comment. Let's look more closely at this. The pic I posted in my tweet was posted by someone else and I had every reason to assume it was the Bath rave. Turns out it was Manchester two weeks ago and this negated my entire tweet, apparently. It's like pool, by which I think here he means people, who say your tweet is wrong because you left out an apostrophe. One exchange later, he added, there was nothing to pick holes in with the text, but what I said irked them. People seem to think every tweet I post here needs to be, he added, making reference to the prestigious book prize, Pulitzer Prize winning, fully fact-checked and proofread tablet of truth because of, and here we might insert the nod to me being a journalist, in my bio. A blue tick, he concluded, referencing Twitter's system for marking authentic accounts of public interest, is a magnet for fools. What do you make of this response? What is interesting about it? Feel free to pause the video now. This is what shouts out to me. To my mind, these comments are interesting for the following reason. It gives us an example of a riposte or defence against online criticism that draws on an important point regarding human fallibility, i.e. that we as humans will inevitably make a mistake at some point that we are not infallible. In this instance, the journalist draws on this to suggest he is blameless to exonerate himself from the charge of deception and poor journalism. In these comments, the journalist suggests that Twitter users should not take what he writes as gospel and instead implicitly calls upon them to use their own critical faculties. Just because he is a self-proclaimed journalist and has been bestowed with Twitter's blue verified badge, it does not mean, we are told, that everything he writes can be taken at face value. At this point, we could quickly descend into a discussion about the responsibilities of journalists, especially on a platform like Twitter, which sees information spread like wildfire. 
For me, the important learning point from this detailed example is this. We must slow down and think about how we use other people's content when we look to contribute to online discussion. In other words, what we see in this relatively small scale and innocuous or relatively harmless debacle is the interconnectedness between the two other parts of the digital creation framework, namely that the input resources or work of others you draw upon and or incorporate in your online communication and the conditions you choose for your creation or communication come together to determine the impact of that creation or communication. In simple terms, what you put in, every element, and the context you choose for the output is going to affect the impact of what comes out. To take the analogy of cooking, your choice of ingredients or elements and where you serve up your final dish will impact the flavour of your dish overall and will play a role in determining whether your end consumer will like or dislike what you have produced. There will be different expectations. If you choose a bad ingredient, Either it will go unnoticed, or maybe it will cause quite a stir. In this instance, the characteristics of a setting like Twitter had their role to play. It is a social media platform with huge reach, on which a mass of content is published every second. Given the volume and the speed of communication, we are encouraged to skim read rather than deeply engage with each snippet. I'll explore this point further elsewhere. Meanwhile, the power of reach with every piece of content discoverable by any user and the encouragement to respond to content through comments, making responses or sharing ideas further, means that once released, we potentially expose ourselves to all levels of critique, some of which might be more constructive than others. Here, the tweet and its content got picked up as enraged residents searched Twitter for answers to the disturbance as well as find others to commiserate with. As we have seen, not all were happy with the update. Once the photo was found not to relate to the text in the tweet, some users looked to attack the entirety of the communication and the author himself. It became personal. This, the journalist felt unfair, not least as there was plenty of other evidence of the existence and scale of the rave and given his intention was never to mislead or deceive as he sought to justify in a parallel thread. It looked so much like the area the rave was held in and it was dawn. Someone tweeted the photo first and I copied it, not for a moment thinking it wasn't genuine. And then I get bombarded with tweets accusing me of misleading and deceiving. So here we have a mismatch between intention of the author and perception of consumers. Whether or not we sympathise with the journalist, the key point is that the ostensible objective of the communication, i.e. to report on antisocial behaviour, was undermined as the communication was perceived to be misleading. It was enough that the details of a source had not been checked, particularly by someone in a profession whose role is ordinarily to update the public on what is happening. What can we learn from this? Well, we need to recognise that verbal attacks meted out online are a possible outcome, one consequence, if we do not put in the necessary time and thought as we prepare our creations and communications, if we are not careful about checking the details of the sources we use. This goes for 280 characters or 280 pages. Here, it was a case of being on the lookout for misattribution, that is the transfer of a picture from one context to accompany a completely different story. In other words, and to link up with our key component in my suggested digital creation framework, the real power or impact of our online creations and communications can be woefully misaligned with our intended impact if we do not exercise due diligence, if we do not slow down and think critically about our creations and communications, what sources we are using and the context in which we are publishing, before releasing material into the ether. In this example, the outcome could have been much, much worse. The journalist regrettably had to deal with online abuse and featured in a local news outlet, the sort of upsetting interaction none of us need and the manner of press many of us do not want to attract. However, at the time of speaking, no legal action has been taken and no one has been irrevocably harmed by the mistake. 
Nevertheless, a similar mistake in different circumstances could have had a very different outcome. Meanwhile, we are given a useful example of the complexity of online creation and communication. We are also given a reminder that if we are not ready to face the response to what we communicate or create online, even if we do give over the necessary time and thought to it, we should think carefully about whether we are ready to become digital creators. Mm -hmm.